Good morning, everybody. Stepping on my microphone. I thought I was a little quiet this morning. I could do better than that. Our call to worship comes from Psalm chapter 7, verse 17. It says this, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. That's exactly what we do today. We gather together so we can give thanks to the Lord because he is good. We give praise and sing praise to him today as a body of believers. Let's open our time with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We give thanks to so many things in our lives, but Lord, uh, in you we live and move and have our being. The very breath that we draw is a gift that you give to us each and every day. And without you, we are hopelessly and aimlessly lost. So Lord, we thank you uh, for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the opportunity to be children of God, to be part of a fellowship of believers, to be ambassadors of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the identity, the direction, the hope that you give each of us as individuals and you give us as a body of believers. So Lord, we want to celebrate you this morning. We want to give you thanks. We want to give you praise. We want to be, we want you to be the Lord of our lives as individuals and uh, as a congregation today. So, Lord, as we sing songs of praise to you, as we lift up your name and reflect on your goodness, as we endeavor to do good in our community and in our world, as we open up your word and apply it to our lives, everything that we do today, Lord, we give it to you, and we want you to be the center of it. Father, we know that there are many who are not able to be here, those who are battling with sickness, difficulty, and struggle. Lord, we pray that you would meet them where they are, whether they are part of this body of believers or not. Lord, you love each and every person. They are all valuable to you, so Lord, I pray that they would be valuable to us. Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we pray that you would be honored and glorified in the time that we have together. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments and greet some of the folks around you. Sit back down. I right know. I have JT say it. JT, tell everybody to sit down. Sit down. That's right. All right, uh, well, well, guys, we, uh, we got a couple announcements, and uh, once again, my, uh, my assistant announce maker, is that, can we make that your official title? Yeah. Assistant announce man. He needs a mic, here you go. You go with that, I'll go with this one. Here, we'll clip it on, man. Get y'all official looking. Boom. Oh, that not up your nose. We don't want to hear you breathing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, just a couple announcements to uh, share with you guys. Uh, tomorrow night, Monday night, uh, at, starting at 6 o'clock, our uh, normal Iron Men meeting is going to be taking place at Lighthouse Church. Uh, we're going to be having our community men's fellowship together. Uh, like I said, that's going to be taking place at Lighthouse Church. Uh, we have uh, some food. Uh, we've got uh, some, uh, we're going to have some uh, wonderful Bible study, uh, a beautiful time of fellowship. Uh, so if you would uh, like to join us, we would love to have you there. There's no cost or anything like that. Uh, that starts at 6 o'clock. On Wednesday, uh, we have our prayer and fellowship time. That meets right here at the church at 7 o'clock. Uh, we do have the prayer list uh, that goes out each and every week. We email that out. Uh, if you did not get one, uh, please uh, make sure you grab a copy. Uh, and on top of grabbing a copy, come join us. Uh, we, uh, we have a, a good time uh, fellowshipping, enjoying each other's company, but we also... What are you talking about over there? Oh, okay, gotcha. All right, we, we, also, uh, we also take some time and uh, uh, go through our prayer lists and, and many things that aren't on our prayer list. So if you, if you are able to come and join us, come and join us. Oh, the cross there, yeah. That's a nice one. It's different on the other side. Got a cross on his neck. That's right. He's got the cross on his neck. We got to talk about extra mile, right? Yeah. 
All right, so right after the service is over, we have a time of meet and greet that takes place right over there. You like meet and greet. They got snacks, right? Yeah, that's good. It, we hang out. You get, to, you get to talk to people. You give a lot of high fives, right? Yeah, show them, show them what you got. Yeah. All right, so we got a, you give out high fives. You get a snack. And then we have our extra mile hour. We have a, a number of different uh, classes that are taking place. We got classes in here for adults. We got classes over there for women. Uh, JT, is there a class you go to? It's back there. Yeah, the class is back there. So, uh, yeah, so uh, there is, uh, we got classes for everybody. Uh, we want to encourage you guys to go the extra mile in your relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, youth night, uh, we are taking a break during the summer, but that does not mean that we are all done. As you guys know, we are going on, a, uh, on our missions trip uh, to America's Keswick the first week of July. Uh, we did our first fundraiser uh, a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, we raised about $1,000. You helped with that, right, JT? Did you pick up trash? Yeah. Yeah. Were the bags heavier than you were? Uh, yeah. Yeah. They were pretty heavy. We, uh, we, we, believe it or not, we, we got over 10 bags of trash that we picked up at the two locations we were doing. We raised a grand total of $1,000 that's going to go uh, to our youth uh, to be applied to their, uh, to their trips to America's Kazakhstan. We do have one more fundraiser that we're going to be doing. We're gonna be, this is going to be taking place on July the 10th, so coming up in two weeks. That's a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're going to be doing one more uh, community cleanup. Uh, then after that, those of you who are going on the mission trip, once we're done the cleanup, uh, we're going to have a missions meeting. We need to talk about some of the details of the trip when we're leaving, when we're getting back, what you need to pack, what exactly we're going to do. We're going to go over all that stuff. Yeah, it's right there. I know. Uh, we're going to go over all that stuff uh, on, uh, on July the 10th. That'll be, uh, we'll do the cleanup and we'll have a mission meeting uh, right afterwards. Do you like videos, JT? Video games, yeah. Video games. Well, we, this one's not a game, but we do have a video. As you guys know, we are, uh, we are getting ready. Getting ready. Uh, <laughs> never mind. You take over. I can't talk anymore. Uh, we're getting ready to launch an Awana program here at the church uh, starting in September. And some of, you are, may, some of you may be really familiar with Awana. Some of you may have no idea what the Awana program is. Uh, so we are uh, going to try and help you guys get familiar uh, with what we're going to be doing in the coming weeks. <laughs> Your sister's coming up here too? All right. Well, as you can see, uh, Awana is a really exciting program that is targeted to uh, the young people in our community. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something for everyone. There is an opportunity for us as a church uh, to serve these young people uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. And we genuinely feel like this is something uh, that our church can offer to our community and that literally each and every person in our church, if they have a heart uh, to do this kind of ministry, right back here, uh, if you're going to rub, uh, yeah, that's great, uh, can, uh, uh, that, that everyone can be a part of that ministry. Does the Wanna, Wanna Clubs look fun to you? Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, my dad cash out at our house. My dad can pick it up. There you go. Even better. And they donate to a book party. <laughs> Very good. Here's how, here's how you guys, if you're interested and want to know how, how you can get involved, uh, on July the 10th, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, uh, Gary Goodrow, who is the Awana missionary, not the same one that was drawn up there, apparently. Uh, Gary Goodrow, who is the Awana missionary for South Jersey and Pennsylvania, is going to be with us on the 10th. After our extra mile hour on the 10th, uh, we're going to have a luncheon. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a question and answer time with Gary. Gary's going to talk a little bit about what Awana programs do and what they, uh, and how uh, we're going to be starting our Awana program in September, how, how people can be involved at different levels. Uh, there are so many things that need to be done on, uh, on an Awana night, uh, and these things aren't always just running around or throwing dodgeballs at people's heads or anything like that. Uh, there, there are a, a myriad of different ways that you can be involved. So on the 10th, uh, Gary's going to be here. Uh, if you are interested in being involved in this program, we're going to talk about how each and every one of you, if you're, if you're so inclined, uh, can be involved with that. Last thing, we got a clipboard here. Can you hold this nice and high for me? All right, hold it up. All right, first of all, I want to give a special thanks to our fellowship committee. How many of you guys have enjoyed having meet and greet back? Yeah. So thank you to our fellowship committee because they uh, work very hard and, 
and very thanklessly uh, to provide uh, snacks and, and uh, a time of fellowship. And we know that that was very missed uh, over the last couple of years. So we are so glad to have that back. That being said, we could use your help with meet and greet. I know, it's got watermelons on it. Watermelon is healthy. Watermelon is healthy. I, I, JT wants you to know that. Do you like watermelon? All right, so JT is a fan of watermelon. But what we, what we could use for you guys uh, is uh, if you could help uh, bring some snacks uh, for meet and greet time, uh, we're going to have a sign-up form right here. Uh, we're going to put it out in the narthex. Uh, so if you have an opportunity and you have a week that you would like to bring in snacks uh, that, that can be partaken of, especially watermelon, right, JT? Especially watermelon. Now, that's all we're going to get. We're, it's going to be nothing but watermelon from here on out. And apples. <laughs> and apples. All right, well, JT, you can go around and tell them afterwards all your favorite things. Um, so uh, uh, if, you would, uh, if you are able uh, and you are willing, uh, that sign-up sheet will be out in the Narthex, and the fellowship committee uh, greatly thanks, thanks you for your donations. All right, anything else? Did we cover everything? All right, well, that's it for announcements, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask the, the youth praise team to come up at this time, and they're going to lead us in praise and worship. Well, good morning again. A little lonely up here by myself. Kind of, kind of weird. This, uh, this may come as a humongous surprise to you, uh, but when I was a child, um, I watched a lot of cartoons. I mean, a lot of cartoons. Um, do you guys remember Saturday morning cartoons? Yeah, it, it, you turn on the TV on Saturday morning. It's not. There's not as many cartoons. I mean, it was like wall to wall cartoons from like seven o'clock in the morning till like, sometimes they got to like one o'clock. I know Dalton's looking at me like, that sounds like the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. It was, in fact, as a young person, this was, I, I had to be honest, this was probably the highlight of my week. Like, get up and it's just like cartoons, 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 all morning long. It was great. So let, before we get into the, what we're gonna talk about today, let me see how well, I, I, I want to know the people that I'm talking to, if they can relate to, to me on this. Let's see how well you know your cartoon. So I, I'm, I'm going to give you an image from a cartoon. If you think you know it, just go ahead and yell out. You don't have to raise your hand. Just go ahead and yell out the cartoon. All right, we, we ready? All right, show them the first one. <laughs> Haley, you got to wait till it's up there. Don't be a cheater. Yeah, this is Scooby-Doo. We love Scooby-Doo. Our, and our favorite uh, crime-solving duo in the Mystery Machine and uh, would have got away with it if it wasn't for you rascally kids and that dog. Great. All right, next one. Jetsons. Jetsons. feel like I went back a little bit on that one. <laughs> you guys nailed that one. <laughs> I'm a little nervous for the next ones. Yeah, you guys, you guys remember Jetsons? I, I, I couldn't find a picture with Rosie in it. I, I, was, I was always fond of, I've always wanted Rosie. Like, I, we have a Roomba that just goes around the house and vacuums. Man, it's, about, it's like my best friend. Um, anyway, so. All right, next one. Yeah, this is my personal favorite. I had to sneak this in there. I love Transformers. Transformers, I, I would still watch Transformers uh, when they have different versions on today. Yes. Uh, Isaiah, you got a Transformers shirt on, don't you? Yeah, that's my boy. Uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, very good. Next one. DuckTales. This is actually DuckTales. Now, this is different than Donald Duck. DuckTales was the story of Scrooge McDuck and uh, Donald went into the Navy in, in DuckTales and left Huey, Dewey, and Louie with Scrooge McDuck. Now, the most awesome thing about DuckTales is that Scrooge McDuck was uh, the, the richest duck in the world and he had a money bin that was just filled with money. And you know what he did with his money bin filled with money? He swam around in it. He dives into the gold. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> only in cartoons could you swim around him. He literally was swimming in a bin full of money. Um, you know, listen, we're not talking about the morality of cartoons. We're just laughing at the, what they can do. All right. Now, you guys, some of you guys got DuckTales. That's, a, that's not a mainstream. I'm going to go really obscure with this last one. And, and if there's anyone who gets this, besides, I love this cartoon. 
if there's anyone who gets this besides me, uh, you're going to be my new best friend. All right? So let's, uh, let's put it up there. Anybody know it? Without looking at the, without looking at the notes? You people back at the computer don't count. No, I'm sorry. Anybody? This was a short-lived, it was only two seasons. This was a short-lived cartoon called Pro Stars. That is Bo Jackson, Michael Jordan, and Wayne Gretzky. And they use their sports skills to fight crimes. It was awesome. I love those guys. One of my all-time favorite cartoons. So dumb. Like, if you watch it today, you're like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. But, hey, you know what? Eight-year-old George didn't care. He thought that was awesome. <laughs> well, as you can see, I've watched a lot of cartoons, some of them incredibly high quality, some of them not so much, maybe. Uh, if I gave you some of the, the storylines from some of the cartoons I've watched in my life, it's pretty laughable. But of all the cartoons that I watched as a kid, uh, there is... I have to be honest, there is still one that I rather routinely watch today. And no matter when it's on, I, I generally stop and at least watch a part of it. And that's VeggieTales. I love VeggieTales. Uh, whether it's silly songs with Larry or pretty entertaining parodies of movies and Bible stories, uh, VeggieTales is, has been one of my favorites well into adulthood. I would like to say that I've grown out of it. And the reality is that I have not grown out of VeggieTales. I will watch VeggieTales. If you put it on right now, I will be like, all right, we'll come back to the sermon later. Let's see what Bob and Larry have to say. It's probably better than what I'm going to tell you anyway. And they're going to have a better story than I do. So, but if you're familiar at all with VeggieTales, you know that after they get done the story, after they get done the silly song, they go to Cordy, the computer, so they can find out what have we learned today. And when they get to that part, there's a song they always sing. And it goes a little something like this. And so what we remember applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. I like that song. Let it play. You see, we know that God's word is for everyone. Now that our song is done to take. And right after they get done with the What Have We Learned song, we talk about what we've learned from that episode. And uh, usually it was something pretty good. Well, believe it or not, that's, that's kind of what we're going to do for the next couple weeks. Now that we've finished our looking at the narrative of the book of Acts, I'm going to take a couple weeks and talk about some of the major takeaways, some of the What Have We Learned from our over one year study of the book of Acts. We started, uh, we started looking at the book of Acts back in February of 2001. We were all much younger people back then. We were younger, more, uh, more hopeful about life. Now time, a lot of time has passed. And uh, during our study of the book of Acts, uh, we've, we've been introduced to some really incredible people from the Bible, Peter, Philip, and Paul. Uh, we visited some really amazing places, Jerusalem, Rome, Athens, uh, we've read about some really incredible events, salvations, trials, shipwrecks. Yet, as we've seen through our various biblical books, the Bible is more than about people, places, and events. It is about understanding who God is, who we are, and what it means to be a genuine follower of God. So today, we're going to start a multi-week recap of what we've learned from the book of Acts. It would be a shame for us to spend so much time studying a book and not take a little bit of time to really reflect on what we've learned from all these Sunday mornings that you've had to sit here listen to me talk about the book of Acts. So today we're going to look at what did we learn about God from the book of Acts? What lessons, what, what things have been revealed about our Creator and Savior from our study of the book of Acts. Well, the first thing that we see about God from the book of Acts is this, that he keeps his promises. There are approximately 8,810 specific promises in the entire Bible. In the Old Testament, there are more than 7,700 of them. In the New Testament, there are more than 1,000 
100 promises from God. Deuteronomy 28 itself has 133 promises just in that one chapter alone. The reality is that the Bible is a book that is full of the promises of God. The reality is the Bible is a lot of things. But maybe the most important thing it, that the Bible does is it records and follows the promises that God has made and that he has kept. Well, why does that matter? Do God's promises matter to us? Well, they should. If we are counting on him as the creator of the world, if we are putting our faith and trust in him as the Lord and Savior of our lives, if we are the one who believes that he can take us from an eternity heading to hell to an eternity as his children in heaven, he better be able to do what he says, shouldn't he? The Bible understands that, and the Bible goes out of its way to show over and over and over again that God makes promises, and he keeps promises. The book of Acts, like nearly every other book of the Bible, focuses on the ongoing story of God's promises that come to pass. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, we read this. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to anyone, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Back in the Old Testament, God made a promise. He says, this covenant that you are living under, this promise that I made to you, this Mosaic covenant, there's going to come a day where I am going to make a new covenant, a new promise to you. And that's what he's describing here in Jeremiah chapter 31. In the book of Acts, we see the promise of the new covenant, which begins with Jesus Christ's death and resurrection spread throughout the world. The story of the book of Acts is the story of this new covenant, not just being offered to Jews and not just offered, being offered to the Jews in Jerusalem, but being offered to all people. God putting his love in every person's heart who is willing to accept it. The pages of Acts reveal how this promise transforms the world and it moves the followers of Christ to share this wonderful news with others. But that's not the only promise that we see God fulfill in the book of Acts. In the, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. See, the narrative of Acts doesn't just share the coming of the new covenant. It also shares God sharing the Holy Spirit with his followers. Isn't that literally how the book of Acts begins? God says, I'm going to give you guys power through the Holy Spirit. They're sitting in Jerusalem, and what does God give them on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. This incredible power to be used for what? So they can get rich? <laughs> no, so they can proclaim this new covenant that God has made with mankind. Literally, the story, the narrative of the book is revolving around these promises that God has made and that he is continuing to keep. Everything that is happening in the book of Acts, the whole story is being driven by what? It's being driven by God's promises. Everything that happens in the book of Acts is happening according to what God has promised. And I'll give you a secret about the Bible. That's not just the book of Acts. Literally, when you read the Bible, the better you know the promises of God, the better you understand why things are happening. Why? 
Because we have a God who always keeps His promises. And when they don't happen in and of, in and of themselves, you know what God does? He gets involved. We saw this in the book of Acts itself, because God doesn't just keep big, world-changing promises, but He also keeps personal ones as well. We saw this in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify about me in Rome. God makes a promise to Paul, we saw this just a few weeks ago, that he was going to go to Rome and he was going to share the gospel there. God doesn't just keep the big promises, does he keep the personal promises as well? Absolutely. It took three years, three trials, two assassination attempts, uh, three ships, one shipwreck, and a snake attack. Not a sneak attack, a snake attack. But did Paul make it to Rome? Why? Because God promised that Paul would make it to Rome. Literally, the world did just about everything it could to keep Paul from getting to Rome, right? But God said, hey, you're going to go there, and just like you witnessed in Jerusalem, you're going to do the same thing in Rome. So did Paul get there? Was it a little bit of a windy road? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But God made a promise, and the book of Acts shows this over and over again, that when God makes a promise, God keeps his promise. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this about the promises of God. God does not give us everything we want, but he does fulfill his promises, leading us along the best and straightest paths to himself. Why do God's promises matter? Because when we put our faith and trust in what God says, it leads us along the straightest paths. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are on it. But narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. How do we find the narrow road? We put our faith and trust in the things that God has said. Because he is faithful and true. He shows us over and over and over again. Thousands and thousands of times in the Bible, he demonstrates his faithfulness. Why? Because at some point today, you're going to need to trust in him. At some point this week, you're going to need to trust in him. At some point in your life, you're going to need to trust in him. And he wants you to know that he's worthy of your trust. So what does he do? He shows us over and over and over again. Well, is that the only thing we learn about God from the book of Acts? Absolutely not. I'm not going to have one point. Come on, are you new here? I got lots of points. The second one is this. He is still working to reach us. One of the things that the book of Acts makes abundantly clear is while the story of the gospel is the story of how Christ saved us, the story of Acts is how God made sure we knew about it. Could God have sent Jesus Christ? He went to the cross, he dies, he rises again, he goes back into heaven, sits down at the right hand of God, and God be done? He could have. Is that what happens in the book of Acts? No, what does he do? He goes out of his way to make sure that salvation is not just paid for, but that we have an opportunity to know about. We find out in the book of Acts that Jesus literally is sitting down at the right hand of God. In Acts chapter 7, we see that the work of salvation is finished. But that does not mean that the work of God sharing salvation is done. In fact, what we see in the book of Acts is that the work of sharing salvation is just beginning. 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
See, God is just as passionate about sharing the cure as he was creating it. And these verses tell us, Peter tells us something, I, I think that's a really hard thing for us as followers of Christ. We want to see justice and righteousness done. And that's, that's a godly thing to want. But Peter says, listen, God is abundantly patient with people, even fallen people, even people who are doing things that are outside of God's desire. Why? God's patience with the world's struggle is a direct result of his desire to give people time to believe. I know we want to see every wrong be made right. There are times that we see evil in the world and we want God to snap his fingers and take those people out of here. But here's the truth. If God made those people vanish, their opportunity for salvation ends. And God doesn't just love us. He loves them as well. Even when they're in the act of rebelling against him, he still loves them and still desires to see them get saved. Romans 5, 7 tells us this, God demonstrated his love for in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The reality is, none of us sitting here were right before God when Jesus Christ came and died for us. We were all in that situation, weren't we? We didn't get ourselves all right, and then God was like, well, you guys did the work, I guess I should go save you. No. Christ came to us first. Christ offered us salvation long before we even came in the ballpark of deserving. And God is still patient with our world, as messed up as it is, as perverse as it is. And listen, you can watch the news for five minutes and know that we are living in a messed up world. And you say, well, why doesn't God just make it all new? Because he loves the people that are in the world. And he's trying to give them time to accept the salvation that has been offered to them. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus says this, And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. You say, well, what's God waiting for? He's waiting for everyone to have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There are many places in our world where they do not have Bibles that they can read in their own language. There are many places in the world where we have not reached them with the good news of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, listen, I'm going to give as many people as I can, as much time as I can. Why? Because I want all people to have the opportunity to be saved. Well, do you think God's plan is going to work? Do you think there's going to be people at the end of human history from all places who are going to worship the Lord and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Well, Revelation tells us exactly what the future is going to hold. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 and 10 says this, after this I looked, and before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, and people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's amazing. Talking about God's promises. God telling you, yeah, this plan, it's going to work. There are going to be people from every tongue, tribe, and nation that are going to join us in heaven. Why? Not because God got mad and snuffed them out. Because God was patient. God was long-suffering with us and with them. God is incredibly loving, incredibly patient. I don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve salvation. Guess what? They don't deserve salvation. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no person can boast. 
Well, there's even more we learn about God from the book of Acts. And that's this, that God includes us in the work of salvation. It's one thing to have a crazy plan. And sometimes we think God's patience is a little bit crazy. It is another thing to add a wild card like us to God's crazy plan. I have been asked on multiple occasions why God trusts something as important as the gospel uh, to people like us. That's a phenomenal question. Um, Again, let me be completely honest. I don't really know. I've spent my entire, believe it or not, I've spent my entire life around human beings. And they are selfish, they are lazy, they are unmotivated. They get tired, they get sick, and they get bored. Some of you are bored right now. So why in the world would God trust as something as important as salvation to people like us? Has he not met us? We're kind of a mess. And he gives us this incredible message to share with the world. This is crazy. This it does not seem like a sound strategy on God's behalf. God's our Heavenly Father, right? We just celebrated Father's Day yesterday, or last week. Um, One of the things about fathers and dads is they like to share the things that are really exciting with their kids. Uh, We we celebrated Father's Day last Saturday, so I, I made my kids play board games and we, you know, we did all, we ate the food I liked and we did the stuff I liked. Why? Because I think that stuff is really awesome. I make my kids watch VeggieTales and Transformers. I collect baseball cards and I make my poor kids collect baseball cards. They do the same stuff that I do. Why? Because I think it's really awesome and I think they're going to think it's really awesome. Now, do they always think it's really awesome? No. But in my brain and in my heart, I'm like, you know what? If my kids will just watch this with me, if my kids will do this with me, they're going to think it's as awesome as I do. You ever think maybe that's why God includes us in the work of salvation? Because salvation is awesome. Seeing someone go from an eternity separated from God to knowing that they have become a child of God and are welcomed into the house and home and family of God is the most amazing thing we could take part in. And God says, man, this is awesome. I want my kids to do this too, because they will love it. The Bible tells us exactly what salvation is like. Psalm 35, 9 says, then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. Psalm 13, 5 says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What does God think about people getting saved? He thinks it's awesome. It fills us with joy and hope. When someone gets saved, we, have, we suddenly look at the world around us and we're like, man, God is doing stuff. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to lead somebody to the Lord. I have been blessed to be able to do it a number of times. And guess what? It is a fond feeling. I can think back to the first person I led to the Lord, and I can remember that with incredible detail. I think about it in my brain, and a smile comes on my face. Why? Because salvation brings joy. How is it that... Peter could be arrested. That Stephen could be persecuted. That Paul could be chased from town to town, shipwrecked and beaten, and still keep sharing the gospel because the joy of seeing people accept the gospel was more powerful than the tribulation they were facing in the world. They did the math in their brain, and they said, this is better than this is hard. Why does God 
include us? I'm not sure I have a definitive answer for you. But I am pretty sure salvation brings life and joy wherever it goes. God wants to share joy with his children. You think God wants us to be filled with life and joyfulness? What dad doesn't want to see his kids happy? God says, hey, join with me in extending our family. Join with me in helping people know I love them as much as I love you. Come, be a part of this. You won't regret it. God invites us to be part of the family business. Not just because it's a job, not just because we got to pay the bills, but because it brings genuine joy, not just to their lives, but to ours as well. One more thing we learn. There, there are a lot more things, but you know, yeah, I went really long last week, so I'm going to make up for it this week. One more thing we learn about God uh, from the book of Acts is that he gives us incredible power. Dr. Paul Brand was speaking at a medical college in India on Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. That verse says, Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In front of his lectern was an oil lamp at, with a cotton wick that was burning from a shallow dish of oil. As he preached, the lamp ran out of oil and the wick started burning dry. And the smoke that was rising up from the wick made Dr. Brand cough. As soon as he composed himself, he used this as an illustration. Some of us here are like this wick, he said to the class. They're trying to shine for the glory of God, but we stink. That's what happens when we use ourselves as the fuel of our witness instead of the Holy Spirit. The wick can last indefinitely when it's dipped in the oil. But without it, it begins to dry and smoke. Dr. Brand's point was a simple one. We have been given this incredible power in the Holy Spirit. And when we immerse ourselves in it, we have the ability to continue to do great and mighty things for God. This is exactly how the book of Acts begins. Acts chapter 1 verse 7, we get this promise from Jesus Christ. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus didn't just send his disciples out, good luck, guys. He says, no, I'm giving you a source of power that will allow you to continue to do this work through the difficulty, through the struggle, through the hatred, through the trials of life. See, God did not send them or us into this mission field unarmed. Over and over again, we see the incredible power of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says this, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for, our, for your sake. While we personally may be frail and afraid, when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. God has given us the power to be more than what we can be on our own with the Holy Spirit. We saw this last week. God doesn't just send us into the evangelism field and say, good luck. He says, I will give you the words to say, I will give you the power you need if you are just willing to open your mouth. That's a hard thing, isn't it? But God, the God who keeps his promises, has promised us power. He's promised us the Holy Spirit. He's promised to be with us. God keeps his promises. He's sharing the gospel. He's using us to do it, and he's giving us help. 
kind of seems like he wants us to go do this, doesn't it? He might be serious. He might really want us to go share this gospel. See, the reality is the Holy Spirit is what gives us the ability. It's what gave Peter the ability to share with authority. It's what gave Philip, Stephen, Paul, and every other person who shares the gospel in the book of Acts. It's what gave them the power to keep going. According to the Bible, is there any indication that the Holy Spirit is not dwelling in each of us? Nope. According to the Bible, we have the exact same Holy Spirit as Peter, Paul, Philip, Stephen, and every other person who shared the gospel in the book of Acts. In other words, the same power, the same authority, the same calling is still in us today. I've used this illustration before, but I think it's a really good one, so I'm going to use it again. When it comes to sharing the gospel, we're kind of like this glove. Now, generally, we use gloves to protect our hands. You know, if we're, we're doing work that we're scared that we, our, our hands could be hurt or damaged. But can this glove in and of itself lift anything? Now, if I, if I put this glove on the ground and, uh, you know, I want it to lift this chair. Can I glove lift? All right. It, it, the glove can't actually do anything on its own, right? All right, what if I, we, we hold things with gloves, right? So what if I grab a pen and I say, glove, I want you to hold this pen. Got it? Come on, man. All right, we got it. A glove in and of itself has very little power. Sometimes we're like that. We're kind of like that glove. But God says, you're not by yourself. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when this glove is filled with my hand, can it then pick up the chair? Yeah, it does all right. Can it grab and hold a pen? Yeah, it actually does a pretty good job. The same is true with us. We may feel like this glove sometimes. I don't want to have a conversation with them. I might go limp. I might not have the words to say. They might bring up a question I don't know the answer to. They may be mean to me. And we feel pretty useless. But the Bible says you're not. You are filled with the Holy Spirit who gives you the words to say, who gives you incredible power an ability that's far beyond what you can do on your own. This promise, given to you by the God who's kept his thousands of promises, is for you. It's for me. It's for all of us who call on Jesus Christ as our Savior. So I want to encourage you, because we've learned this from our study of the book of Acts. These truths were not just for them. These truths are for us as well. We read and study the Bible, not just so we can know facts, not, so, not just so we can answer questions, but so that we can do these things ourselves. Why? Because God has asked us to be part of his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who keeps his promises that you are a God who is still at work in this world. You're a God who has included us in your work of salvation. And that you're a God who has given us tools, given us the Holy Spirit to help. It is one thing to know these things. It's one thing to take a year of Sunday mornings and look at narratives that have talked about them. It is another thing completely to actually do these things in our lives. And Lord, if we've studied the book of Acts for a year and it hasn't changed our lives any, in any practical way, what an incredible waste of time it has been. 
Now, I don't believe that your, your word wastes our time. I think it is powerful. I think it inspires us and moves us, teaches us, rebukes us. So I pray that we would take these lessons that we've learned from the book of Acts about who you are and that we would apply them to our lives. We thank you that you are a God that we can trust. We thank you that you are a God who is at work in this world. You care about the people of this world and you're still trying to reach them even after making a way for them to get to heaven. I pray that, I thank you that you include us in this wonderful task of sharing the good news with people. And I thank you that you have made provision for us to help us do this. Because sometimes we, we find reasons not to. Guide us. But help us to do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Today, our benediction comes from Philippians 4, 7, and it says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.